Hi, my name is John Morrissey. I'm from University College Cork in Ireland and I'm Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Yeast Research. So first of all, let's start with the session that already took place, the session about yeast, right? That's right. You know, it was a great session. I think the measure of a good session is the amount of questions and my problem as chair was actually stopping questions. So that, 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 that was really good. And the, the focus of the session was on beneficial role of yeast in, uh, in production of fermented foods and flavours. I mean, there are a few different themes that, that came out in the course of, of the talk. One was yeast diversity, because there's quite a few different yeast species, which we now find uh, have roles in fermented products. You know, traditionally, we, we think of um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and, and beer and wine and so forth. But in fact, we were more focused, I would say, on uh, cheeses and some, um, some, some yeasts that are associated with cheese ripening and uh, con contributing to cheese flavours. Um, some interesting yeasts like De Debaromyces hensinii, which some people consider a spoilage yeast, but in fact also has some very interesting properties in controlling spoilage organisms. So we talked about that. We, we, we had a couple of talks that looked at how yeast um, metabolites can contribute to flavour. And this is a really interesting trend in the whole uh, food sector because there's interest in alternative foods, replacement for some traditional sources of foods, especially coming from dairy or meat. And a yeast can contribute quite a lot of flavours which are similar to, let's say, meat flavours or unami flavours. Um, and so some of the talks focused on that. So we had kind of a diversity of talks around those themes. And currently, how, how would you say is yeast usage in products? There are some traditional, I'll call it a yeast product, like, like Marmite, which was mentioned in the session, which is literally pure yeast. But uh, yeast extract is quite commonly used in, in the food sector, um, partly because it can contribute a meaty flavour as, as, as a food ingredient. So uh, as, um, at the moment, I would say as a commodity product, yeast is used um, in, in, in the food sector. But where the, where the interest lies is really maybe moving up the value chain and using specialised yeast or yeast that have been um, improved for, for certain applications to actually make higher value products that will be um, uh, used in diverse foods, I would say. Is it more looking like we add yeasts into the food themselves or do we use yeast to produce some uh, minerals or whatever and we use those as additives to the food? Yeah, I think we're seeing both, both directions actually because one of, one of the interesting directions is to use yeast themselves and their fermentative activity in products and so the, the interesting metabolites and, and flavours would be produced as the normal course of activity of the yeast along with their other function. That's one part. But I would say that um, the alternative, which is um, essentially growing yeast cultures and either purifying a product from the yeast culture or, or maybe um, extracting something from the yeast or even using dried or lysed yeast mm -hmm. as, as an ingredient, that, that's the other growth. Mm -hmm. so, so both are actually happening. Yeah. So this afternoon you're going to give your own personal talk and it's going to be it's titled domestication of yeast in nature and for biotechnology so what will that be about okay well i don't want to give all of it away now because then you won't come to it right but but um what, what one of the one of the key trends that we've seen um in recent years in, in the yeast area related to food is the realization that yeasts have been associated with human activity and fermentation for a long time for thousands of years and what we see is that for a lot of fermented foods uh, where yeasts are associated with them, and I'm thinking beverages and dairy products, um, but also things like soy sauce and miso, that, that strains appear to have been selected or have co-evolved along with, with the human activity of making the process or making the food. And we're seeing increasing evidence for what we might call domestication. Now that, that's kind of a loaded term, but, but basically, we think that we have selected yeast strains to carry out certain functions, and those strains are different from their wild relatives. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, and I'm going to be talking. I'm going to give you a couple of very specific examples of, you know, from my own research where we've worked on Cluvermyces, and we've shown how Cluvermyces marxianus has been domesticated uh, for lactose fermentations, for making uh, cheeses and kefir and, and products like that. And we're going to show how some of those genes transferred 
to, to another Cluvermyces species that's, that's called Calactus. And so, you know, I will be kind of making a point that uh, it, over the course of evolution, transfer of genes between organisms and between yeasts is, is, is quite common. So I'll, I'll be talking about the domestication in that sense. But then I'll be talking about how we can use that information and if we want to design and build strains for new applications, how can we take the knowledge of what nature has done in domestication already? How can we integrate that with synthetic biology tools? How, how can we sort of mimic the, the selective and continuous cultivation processes that people have used, that people inadvertently, maybe mm -hmm. without knowing they were domesticating organisms used? And can we accelerate now the production of new strains for interesting applications mm -hmm. um, for economic benefit and, and for societal benefit? Yeah, and in your experience, where was the craziest place you, you would have found yeasts naturally? Well, I'm going to tell you the craziest place um, because I, I was telling somebody else earlier. There's a paper actually came out in, uh, in, a, in a journal in a, about a month ago where they, hadn't, they didn't isolate the yeast itself, but they isolated uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae DNA. And you wouldn't guess this one. The source was fossilized feces fossilized human feces from the Iron Age. And in fact, in, in that particular study, the, this was in the Hallstatter salt mines in, in Austria, they, they did a metagenome analysis, metagenome analysis of all the DNA. They identified not, not only Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but also Penicillium rock 40. Mm -hmm. That's a fungus I'll mention as, as well this afternoon. And you know, one conclusion um, for, from, from that study is that the living was very good back in the Iron Age because people were eating Roquefort cheese and drinking beer. So while the yeast wasn't isolated, the, the yeast was there. So, so that's an unexpected yeah. example, I think. Of course, of course. And now let's move into um, your involvement with the uh, FEMS journal, FEMS Yeast Research. Um, so you are the editor in chief there. Um, and I know there's, there's a few words that you would like to say uh, for all of the audience that is watching. One thing I would say is, you know, FEMS Use Research, it's one of the journals of FEMS, which is a learned society that's representing a lot of different microbiology societies around Europe. And publishing is a very important thing that scientific societies do, um, because it, it gives authors a chance to, to publish their work. Um, we, we take, I suppose, we take the values of scientific publishing very seriously. So the quality of publications coming from uh, FEMS journals is very high, you know, in terms of the peer review process, the quality of our editorial boards. So, so you know, when you publish a paper in, in a society journal, a FEMS journal, including uh, yeast research, I mean, you are guaranteed um, a high quality um, evaluation process, and you know that the papers you can read uh, are trustworthy. And I think that that's, that's a very important thing in an era when there are many, many papers being published. The, the other point I, I would make is, you know, there's a lot of competition for, for papers. Um, you, you know, people get emails all the time soliciting papers, lots, lots of um, big commercial publishing houses. And while there's not necessarily anything wrong with that per se, you, you know, the, the income that scientific societies make from their journals goes back into the community. Mm. You know, so FEMS uh, sponsors meeting grants, poster prizes at conferences, travel grants for young researchers. So, you know, so the money goes back. So I, I would say, you, you know, that um, I, would, I would really encourage um, authors uh, to, to look at society journals um, and if you're working in the yeast area I would say you know famous yeast, yeast research is the society journal for yeast mm -hmm. so um, I would encourage people to submit their papers um, to the journal. And are there any specific calls right now? Sure yeah I mean so so I mean famous yeast research is a, is a broad scope journal you know so we will accept papers on almost any aspect of, of, of yeast research once it sort of advances the knowledge of, of, of yeast. While we have that broad, you know, open call in for papers anytime, we do have two specialized calls out at the moment. One of them is for a special issue that's going to be on yeast uh, physiology and metabolism. And the reason that we chose that topic right now, in fact, it's a memorial issue uh, in memory of, of, of um, a scientist called Lex Sheffers, who passed away during the year, who was the first editor-in-chief of um, FEMS Yeast Research. But also he was a seminal figure in sort of revitalizing yeast research, you know, in, in, the, in the last, um, I suppose in the last 40 years of, of the last century, because he really put a strong emphasis on understanding physiology and quantitative work.
um, and a lot of the work that he did was kind of foundational for the later development of the whole bioethanol sector. So we're very interested in getting more papers from people working on any aspect of yeast physiology and metabolism, any yeast, uh, any yeast species, and um, we will collate all those papers together and we will launch a thematic issue of, of the accepted papers uh, next July. And that's going to be launched to coincide with, with a, a yeast conference, ISSY 36, uh, Sun to Sea, which is going to be held in Vancouver in Canada. And so for papers that are in that thematic issue, they'll get extra promotion and publicity and so forth. And then we have a second uh, a special issue called for papers at the moment on yeast lipids. And that covers two aspects because lipids are obviously really important for the fundamental biology of yeast, um, for making membranes and the signal molecules and all, all sorts of things. That's one side. And the other side is that there's a lot of interest in uh, yeast products. Um, in fact, the, the keynote talk uh, this morning from Professor Jens Nielsen talked about producing designer um, fatty acids that can be used, for example, to give um, enhanced texture and flavor to alternative meats. So, so there's a lot of interest in, in making different kinds of lipids for different applications. And so again, um, there's a there's very interesting uh, yeast conference, yeast lipid conference on uh, in Gothenburg next June, YLC 2022. And we will have this thematic issue to launch at that conference. So again, anybody who's doing research on any aspect of yeast lipids in, in any yeast organism, you know, we, we would welcome you to submit your paper and it will be reviewed in, in a normal way. And, and then hopefully we'll have a nice collection of papers that we launch together. Yeah. Uh, all papers will be published on a rolling basis, but, but we will sort of launch the TI and pub publicize them in June. That was the last question I have for you today. Uh, thanks so much for your time and good luck in your presentation. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure chatting.